Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I'm going to talk about a language that I've been working on with Jonathan Reagan Kelly and others at MIT and Stanford. And the goal of it is to make high performance image processing code easier to write mostly, but also more portable and more modular. So why do we care about this as computer vision people? Well, so you want to get your computer vision algorithm out there in the real world, maybe as an, uh, an iPhone app. It's written in MATLAB, so you just need to port it to BC and it'll port it to C and it'll be fast, right? Unfortunately, this is no longer the case. C's machine model is, is no longer sufficiently close to reality that this is going to get you uh, as good a performance as you can get. So let's look at an example. OK, so this is a very simple uh, algorithm. It's a 3x3 three three box filter that's been decomposed into a a horizontal filter followed by a vertical filter. And you can see that I've allocated some temporary storage to uh, you know, store the output of the horizontal filter that I then vertically filter. Um, you can assume here that I've got guard bands so we can ignore boundary conditions for this case. So the problem is that even with you know, all compiler optimizations turned on, this is 10 times slower than this on the same CPU. And this is just doing a handful of simple optimizations that most people are familiar with. Uh, the first thing we do is we parallelize the outer loop over Y using OpenMP. And let's see, is this laser? And that, that was the easy part. That just involved adding this line up here, pragma OMP parallel 4. And now we're running in parallel. OK, then we want to compute things in vectors. Uh, instead of just you know, doing scalar math. And th these are all 16-bit values, which is pretty common for image processing. So we, instead of all our nice multiplications and additions, we now have a bunch of vector intrinsics, uh, additions and multiplications. And well, actually, the divide by 3 became some sort of fixed point multiplication that wraps around in the right way. Um, now, in theory, those two operations should be enough to make this 32 times faster, because we have a four-core machine and we can do eight wide 16-bit ops. In practice, it makes it about four to five times faster. This is very typical for computer vision algorithms because what happens is when they're scalar code, they tend to be compute limited. But as soon as you start to vectorize or parallelize, you quickly run out of memory bandwidth. These operations typically do very little math per uh, pixel, and then they operate on large images, so they have to stream the whole image in from memory. OK. So what can we do? Well, we partially fuse the horizontal blur with the vertical blur. We compute the horizontal blur in a small tile, uh, 256 wide and 34 high. And we use that to compute a small tile of the output, 256 wide by 32 high. Of course, the 34 becomes 32 because the footprint of the kernel needs a little bit more. So we do a little bit of wasted work here. Uh, so in some sense, we're trading off a little bit of recompute for better sort of producer-consumer locality. And by doing this, we have the intermediate output in cache, and we have higher bandwidth from cache, so we can uh, keep the second stage of the algorithm fed without it waiting on memory bandwidth, and the result is that it's 11 times faster. Okay, great, but um, I don't think anyone would actually want to write this kind of code or... It's kind of write once, read, never code. Uh, and it has a pretty short lifespan because as soon as the underlying architecture changes a little bit, or as soon as you want to port to a slightly different device or use a different data type, it's useless. Uh, so it's hard to write, hard to understand. It's extremely hard to, to um, change. If you decide you wanted to test out different optimization strategies, you can't really do that without rewriting it. Um, it's not portable, not reusable but it's an order of magnitude faster. And that's with a, a machine that was a couple of years old. This disparity is growing as, machine gets more, as machines get more, core, more cores and as uh, vector widths expand. OK. So we decided that we would try to get around this by uh, T 
teasing apart these optimization concerns, like fusion and parallelizing and vectorizing, from uh, the actual statement of the algorithm. So we came up with a language that does this. Uh, it's called halide, because that's a nice, sexy, photography-related word. Um, and we call the uh, optimization concerns the schedule. And we call uh, the code that actually defines the algorithm just the algorithm. And let's have a look at what that previous example looks like in Halide. So instead of uh, images, we have pure functions. And uh, where we would normally create uh, uh, images based on other images, we instead define functions based on other input functions. So we define the, this temporary function based on a horizontal blur of the input. And then we define this blurred function uh, based on a vertical blur of that temporary function. So these are pure functions. Um, over an infinite integer domain. Uh, so we um, push boundary conditions aside. And what we do uh, is we take the input image and you wrap that in a function which defines a boundary condition for it. And from then on, everything's over an infinite integer domain. Everything's side effect free as well. So we're free to expand these bounds to compute more of something if necessary. Uh, you know, if we want to round up the width of an image to be a multiple of four so we can vectorize efficiently. We're free to do things like that. So the algorithm stated there, and the schedule is down below it, and that's its own separate little set of calls which uh, specify all of the transformations that we applied to the code to make it run 11 times faster. So we uh, compute things in tiles, and we vectorize and parallelize, and then we uh, compute temp in chunks, within a certain loop nesting level of the output. OK. So that's the basic idea of the language. Um, oh, I should mention also that this is actually just C++ code. Um, where do you specify that you can place your division So that is the kind of. Uh, low-level tweak that we expect the compiler to be able to do. Uh, in this case, I think the fixed point multiplier is exact, so we just always do that for this case. Uh, yeah. It works out due to some modular arithmetic, and I think. Um, we can, we are, in our other cases, we uh, do play some games with precision because we're domain specific. We know we're doing image processing. So you don't always care too much about that least significant bit. But I think in this case, it actually worked out. So this is C++ code. Um, it's a function in C++ that defines a little halide pipeline. So when you actually want to evaluate this, you say, please realize, please evaluate this function blurred over this square domain, and it, it JIT compiles a small piece of code that does that. And uh, based on the domain of the output that you request, it also JIT compiles in code that will compute uh, what regions of all the other functions need to be computed. And it uses sort of some symbolic interval arithmetic to propagate those bounds backwards through the pipeline. OK, so that's the basic idea. And uh, I have a bunch more slides that go into detail about the all the different scheduling options down there. Uh, I have some more complete algorithms. Um, and uh, I also have results, of course. But now would be a good time to pause and maybe uh, have questions or just a discussion about whether or not performance matters for computer vision, or if people have other questions about the language. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So we see OpenCL as a potential backend. One of our backends right now is CUDA, or CUDA's um, sort of intermediate representation, PTX. And uh, this means that we can take the same algorithm and just change the schedule to be one that maps to the GPU instead. So we, it's really nice we can take the same algorithm code and run it efficiently on CPU or GPU. Um, I guess OpenCL can do that to some extent, but still a lot of the schedule is baked into the algorithm statement. OpenCL assumes that you're running inside this 
uh, parallel for loop nested for deep, and you have to make your algorithm fit that model. Whereas here we specify the algorithm however we want to, and then separately specify how that maps onto that parallel for loop. But what do you win versus direct deep as opposed to scale? Mostly what you win is fewer lines of code and portability. So we have a separate construct called a reduction domain. And that's equivalent to um, sort of defining a function, defining a function uh, as if it were the end process in a reduction over functions. So let me show an example. Um, yeah, I'll have to exit the slides for this. Tests, Instagram. Okay, so this is how we compute a histogram. This is out of our unit tests folder. Uh, so we declare a function, uh, let's see, we declare a function histogram here, and oh, this code is out of date. We declare a reduction domain. Whoops. You know, I'm going to turn on mirroring so I can actually see what I'm typing. <coughs> so, uh, arrangement. Mirror displays. Okay. Yeah, why don't I, uh, I have a similar example in the slides, so I'm just going to jump back to the slides. Okay. Um, so you define a reduction domain, and then a function uh, can refer to other instances of the same function. Um, and the effect, uh, you define an initial version of the function, and you define a recursive <laughs> statement of the function, and the effect is that you're constantly patching a function with your saying, uh, my function is equivalent to whatever the old version of my function was, except at this instance, it has this value. At this side, it has this value instead. And that may refer to the previous value at that side or other values at other sites. So to define histogram, you say hist of image of xy plus plus. And that computes a histogram. Yeah, two questions. Um, first, what, what's the language concept behind? Like you, you reference, uh, you, you refer to referential integrity, which is of course not part of C++. So, so, so is there a language concept behind that? For presumably a, a functional. And mm -hmm. the other, other question is, how sustainable is your computational model saying that um, C is uh, uh, having an outdated Mm -hmm. So, um, we're basically model, modeling things on how image processing would look like in Haskell, say, uh, if images were represented as functions from you know, an, an integer tuple to some output value. So we tried to be very strict about side effects, except for things like debugging. And then C++, you can really abuse C++, so we... Uh, can embed these kind of functional uh, definitions within that just by abusing operator overloading. And that lets us integrate more cleanly with your host code in a way that I find a little ugly with more shader-like languages. Um, as far as future proofing goes, our goal was to make the statement of the algorithm as divorced as possible from uh, its adaptation onto a particular piece of hardware. So I'm pretty optimistic about that. You may need to, uh, we divorce the algorithm statement from the concerns about hardware, but we don't let you not specify the concerns about hardware. You still need to think about those things. We just push all that into the schedule half. 
So for new algorithm, you do need, uh, for new hardware, you will need to change the schedule. Yes. And the fact that that doesn't happen in C++ is a bit of a shock. <coughs> so, uh, in your piece of C, which you said was OK, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, some of the lines are the way they are because of hardware issues, and some of the lines are the way they are because that's what we used to do in the whole back chat. Now, what you've done is you've collected one set of lines in one place, a bunch of other lines in another place. <laughs> so, I don't like this code. Um, because the optimization concerns are sort of hopelessly mixed in with the algorithm. I really wanted to separate the two so that you can think about whether or not the algorithm is correct separately from thinking about how to make it run fast. So what's the underlying conception machinery that allows you to do that? The underlying conception machinery? Well, here's one piece of code. Here's right. another piece of code. That piece of code manipulates concepts whose names you've used, you know, some of these domains and stuff. But what, what's, what's sort of the engine? Um, I think the thing that makes it work is it's almost a metaprogramming approach. We restrict the algorithm statement to being something more pure functional. And then we ex instead of expressing the optimizations as part of that, we express them as a post-transformation applied to that. The, this code or? No, the, uh, the actual code. Oh, like a, a real example? Yes, or, where, where it's called. Is that possible to show? Um, it seems like you almost had that up before. Um, you mean just in Emacs? Or? Yes, yes. Sure. Uh, so we can JIT compile, I should say, but we can also statically compile. So what that code tends to look like is there's a final line that says blurred.compile to file and then a file name, and that'll spit out an object file and a header that you incorporate with your existing project. Uh, so the examples I have mostly do that, but I can try to... I'll open a more interesting example of that. All right, so this is code to do uh, level set segmentation based on the snake algorithm. So I have a bunch of these sort of functions that take functions, or C++ functions that take highlight, highlight functions to do basic things like compute small filters. Um, and then if I scroll all the way down, I have some scheduling code. In this case, it's a very simple schedule. And then, this is an iterative algorithm, so I define a halide pipeline that does just one iteration, and then I repeatedly apply that. Um, more functions. Right. And this is C++, right, that so you're doing some uh, JIT compilation. Mm -hmm. uh, we just link to LLVM and ask it to compile things for us on the fly. Right. Yeah. So here's the... Uh, piece of code that actually evaluates a function into a concrete array. Um, and that, the first time you run it through, that does the JIT compilation. Uh, if you haven't already, oh, in this case we have already because we didn't want to mess up our timing code with the JIT compilation, it's just phi-new.compile-JIT up there. Uh, and now phi-buff2, I believe, is just some sort of basic image type that you can then use. So you define this function, and then you say, realize the function into this image, and it evaluates the function over that domain and populates that image. Okay. Yep? Uh, this code looks a little bit more difficult, so it might be that you also have an error in the code. Um, so, what we typically do for debugging is because we control code gen, we can, uh, well, we can do printfs, is one way. We, can, we have a debug expression that will, whenever that is evaluated, it will print something out. But we can also turn on a tracing mode, 
which tells you every time uh, a load or a store occurs to a particular buffer or to a particular realization of an image at a particular location and what the value is. And we're also working on some visualization tools so that you can see each image slowly appear as you run through the pipeline. So I found it fairly easy to debug, actually. I think I've been ignoring you for a while. Can you speak a little bit more about the level of expertise that you expect from the programmer? In particular, if I understand correctly, you expect the programmer to be capable of writing the initial ugly code, but they can just do it quicker That's right. and more the cleanly with using Halo. Yeah, the people we've been thinking about are people who are capable of understanding how to vectorize and parallelize things, but they don't want to write code that they're never going to be able to use again. Um, we've also been thinking about cases where you have a separate person who is writing the algorithm, and then you hand that off to an architecture expert who figures out how to make it run fast without having to touch the first person's code. So, would it be fair to say uh, we have a MATLAB 2.6 portal that specifies the algorithm part and then some knowledgeable person adds the scheduling parts and, and then you're done? Uh, it's quite similar to MATLAB and in fact we were surprised that MATLAB doesn't already do something like this. Um, MATLAB does deal with things as explicit arrays <coughs> and you have to worry about boundary conditions and things like that whereas we provide a little bit more support uh, there. Um, but yeah, it's fair to say that this is a high-level language com combined with a scheduling language that gives you fast code. Um, have you thought about the uh, output of your code, I mean, in terms of speed, how it compares to hand-optimized code like from the Intel IPP? How could we you have. Get if you take that as like the we have. You could reach? Yeah. We're... Why don't I show some results slides? Actually, you... oh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump to the results slides. Oh, so here's some detail about how scheduling works. Let's get through this. There is a language for scheduling. It makes sense. You can see the details in SCGraph paper. These are all the different ways of traversing a domain. Bilateral grids, one of our examples. Sorry, Kevin, I'm skipping over your algorithm. <laughs> Okay, so the bilateral grid, uh, this is an example where uh, Sylvain Paris's nice clean C implementation, um, let's see, it, it took about 470 milliseconds and using many fewer lines of code, we took 80 milliseconds. Uh, but that doesn't compare to say IPP. If we want to compare to oh, IPP, oh, this is a good example actually before we get to the IPP one. Uh, we wrote a software post-processing pipeline in assembly for the Franken camera project so that we could have fast demosaicing and color correction and whatnot on the N900. And that code was in a night nightmare. Um, I think I inspired at least one undergraduate to quit doing research with us because he helped us with that code. And in many, many fewer lines of code, we achieved the same performance. And how I did that was I copy-pasted the comments from the original code, which had the algorithm in pseudocode and just massage those into the uh, halide statement of the algorithm. So we were faster than tuned assembly in this case, an assembly that I beat my head over for a long, uh, for a long time, and we're portable where the tuned assembly wasn't. Uh, here's another example. This is local Laplacian filters. So we took Sylvain Paris's code that uses OpenMP and Intel performance primitives, and on his laptop that took 627 milliseconds on a quad core, uh, on a four megapixel image, and our code using many fewer lines of algorithm and just a little bit of scheduling um, was twice as fast. And they're both vectorized, they're both parallelized. Yeah. So is it the case that you're using the number of lines as a proxy for amount of time to code them? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to use it as a proxy for the readability of the result. I'm not guaranteeing that it's faster to code, but it does make the result easy to read. For, uh, have, you, have you tried working with CRS to like, revision audience, uh, like the bloodlines, uh, permutahedral lattice stuff for 
fully right. connected Galaxy and CRF via Great Gamma. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, that, so the, the permutahedral lattice that accelerates, that was my dissertation. And um, we've been unable to express that algorithm because it relies heavily on a hash table to store values on a lattice, which is not a grid. Uh, and it's a high dimensional thing, so we can't embed it in a grid without any cursive dimensionality. So sparsity is something we can't handle. In general, non-image data structures is something we can't handle right now. Well, then you, I mean, so then you can get rid of the permutahedral ladders and just use the bilateral grid for fully connected CRS, can you? Uh, it depends on the dimensionality, because the bilateral grid will explode at higher dimensionalities, just because it has this exponential dependence on dimension. But possibly, yeah. Yes, because it's very slow to try out new schedules. So we have a string of 13 different schedules we tried that took a couple of hours to run through. Um, and we found that the best one, so this generates a bunch of image pyramids and then combines them in interesting ways. We found that the best one uh, inlined all of the Laplacian pyramid levels and also inlined the coarsest level of the Gaussian pyramid level. And it you know, vectorized across this dimension and it split things into uh, chunks of four scan lines and parallelized across that. And in a few hours, we could try lots of different schedules. And we found that this one was much, much faster um, than the one that Sylvain had baked into his code, which was uh, computing more things globally. So he was memory bandwidth limited, and we weren't. Yeah, I totally buy that that's a useful thing to do. Um, you said you only work on. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, we, arbitrary dimensionality. But most of our syntactic sugar only goes up to four dimensions, but in principle, it's arbitrary. So here's a slightly more computer visionary, uh, computer vision y application uh, where we actually took MATLAB code and not MATLAB code that uses for loops, um, like proper MATLAB code that operates on vectors at a time. Uh, now, this I believe is horribly bandwidth limited because there's no other way we could have gotten the result that we did. Uh, we found that running our code on the same CPU using Halide, uh, we were 70 times faster. We used more lines of code than MATLAB because we have these sort of, you know, we define a C++ function that takes in a Halide function and defines a new Halide function then returns that, whereas MATLAB does that all in just one line. Here is a new matrix as a function of some other matrix. Um, we did minimal scheduling because this algorithm, it works, it does a whole bunch of different stencils and combines them, so it works well just to inline everything, which is our default schedule. And we were 70 times faster on the CPU, and just for fun, we also uh, ran it on the GPU, and there's just an if statement that says, if this flag is set, then compile for GPU instead, and that compiles a whole bunch of GPU kernels and mixed CPU, GPU orchestration, and that was 1,267 times faster. Uh, yes, yes. You'd need to specify how it maps onto the GPU, which is this quadruple nested for loop, which is a matter of calling a single function that says these dimensions of my halide function map to these dimensions of the GPU. How long does it take you or somebody that's good at writing in this to port an algorithm like that to the halide? Um, how long does it take? Uh, well, Savan Paris did this in an afternoon, and that was his introduction to the language. Perhaps this is a particularly easy algorithm because it's mostly just local stencils. Um, then I went through and cleaned up the code for, you know, there were some things that he didn't realize there was an easier way to do it. Uh, generally, I find this pretty easy because it's the way I think about I, I aimed it to be the way you write the image processing code on a whiteboard. You know, this image of x, y equals this function of some other images. Why does it have to be functional? I don't think it has to be functional. We just found that to be a convenient expression because we can embed it in C++ easily. <coughs> and it's an expression that naturally emits. Uh, when you have an imperative statement of the algorithm, it's tempting to bake in information about scheduling. You know, there is a particular loop nest order. 
So we found that it was easier to avoid accidentally baking those things in with a functional language. The interface? Yeah. So like if you have a function called parallel or factorize or whatever, how do you change the number of arguments or the stuff like that? So how stable is this language already? Oh, um, well, we finished the current version of it just in time for the SIGGRAPH deadline earlier this year. Uh, so I would say not very stable. We're still tweaking it. And we, we haven't released it publicly yet. We plan to do a public release in August. And hopefully it will be more stable at, at that point. But it is still quite painful to use because, uh, for example, a syntax error in your original halide definition right now, in some cases, propagates through to a segmentation fault somewhere inside the last stages of compilation. So it needs a lot more love before this will be a friendly thing to use. OK. OK, great. Thanks.